let's get on with the first panel. I'll bring them up. Now, remember, we're going to talk about the past, present, and future of the British economy across the course of today. So first of all, uh, to get us started on where the country's got up to, uh, you're going to hear from uh, Baranesh Manoush Shafiq, who is the director of the London School of Economics and one of the co-chairs of this inquiry, for which we are very grateful indeed. So Manoush, come on up. Then from uh, Maurice Barrage, who is the director of the Fraser Valland Institute in, uh, up in Scotland. And if you don't follow their work, you absolutely should be. They're a great institution. Uh, Lord Adair Turner is economist and business leader, in brackets, along with many, many other uh, things up to come a day. And Greg Thwaites is a research director of the Resolution Foundation and one of the authors of uh, today's report. So let's get going. My name is Gregory Thwaites. I'm one of the uh, research directors at RF. The aim of this short presentation is to explain what we mean by stagnation and why we think the UK is at serious risk of it. But let me start by acknowledging and celebrating the UK's many economic strengths. The UK is securely a member of the OECD Club of Rich Nations. Our incomes are slightly above the median for that group. And we have a high employment rate, about the 75th centile of the OECD. We're a world leader in service exports. In fact, we're the world's second largest exporter of services, behind only the US. People think this is just about banking, but as my colleague Dan will come on to tell you in a bit, they're wrong. It's much broader and deeper than this. And you can see here some of the examples. We also have deeper strengths. In uncertain geopolitical times, we're members of NATO. Uh, our geographic location as an offshore European island affords us a relatively high degree of security. We're insular in terms of our geography, but we're not remote. We're in the middle of these uh, dense networks of um, international trade and travel in the North Atlantic. Um, and in the context of climate change and the steps necessary to limit it, of course, everyone is vulnerable. Uh, the UK is perhaps slightly less vulnerable than many other countries to the effects of global warming. And we have relatively high meteorological and geological potential to generate renewable electricity. So we've got plenty to be thankful for and even, even pleased about. But the UK is in a period of relative decline. What do we mean by that? This chart shows how productive some comparable com countries are relative to the UK, where I'm measuring productivity as the amount of GDP per hour worked, and I'm controlling for differences in prices across countries and over time. And you can see here that the UK is less productive than all three of these countries, but also that you, we managed to narrow this gap somewhat between 1990 and the mid-2000s. But then we allowed it to widen again a very great deal in the subsequent 15 years. During the uh, period between the global financial crisis and today, UK labour productivity grew at half the rate of the OECD, so OECD average, and this was the result. This is what relative decline looks like. Now, productivity is the main driver of GDP growth in the long run, so our poor record on productivity has fed into an exceptionally low rate of growth of GDP per capita. What's exceptional in this chart, which is accumulating growth over 15 years, is not just how low growth has been recently, but how long it's been low for. You can see here in the gray uh, that GDP growth in the past 15 years has been the lowest at least since the 1930s. Now, just as productivity drives GDP, GDP is the main driver of incomes. The colored lines here in this chart show that growth in incomes has followed growth in GDP south. All parts of the income distribution, as you can see here, all the different centiles that I'm showing you in these lines, have seen income growth fall. But in the 1980s, we saw something different, which was the median and the top doing very well um, and, and the bottom doing badly. So the 1980s was a period of, of growing inequality, whereas the recent period has been one of broadly stable inequality at a very high level. And so that period of rapid growth in inequality in the 1980s propelled the UK towards the top of a league table that we don't really want to dominate. And this chart shows us, this chart shows us two standard measures of income inequality for a range of countries. The UK has the highest Gini coefficient of any major European economy. Inequality rocketed in the 1980s and since then remained broadly flat depending on the measure used. So I've shown you that the following many years of weak growth, the UK, we've got unexceptional levels of productivity and hence GDP per capita along with high levels of inequality. This chart shows the amount of GDP per job in different areas of the UK. You can see that London is far and away the most productive part of the country, and that high it's a high productivity by anyone's standards. 
The problem with the UK is the high level of inequality across places, and in particular the fact that, with the exception of Edinburgh, the other big cities that we have are a long, long way behind. And once again, my colleague Dan will come back to this point a bit later on. So we've got big inequality across people, big inequality across places. This combination of low average incomes along with high inequality means that UK incomes at the middle and at the bottom of the income distribution are a long way behind those in countries we might want to compare ourselves to, like France and Germany. This chart shows the income gaps in Germany, France and Italy relative to the UK for the bottom, the middle and the top of the income distribution. You can see here that the median French household is, uh, has about 10% more income than its UK counter counterpart, while the number's closer to 30% at the 10th centile of the distribution. Top French households actually have a little bit less than their UK counterparts. Germany's incomes are higher all the way across these three points of the distribution. It's also the case, by the way, and very importantly, that UK's lower incomes are concentrated in certain demographic groups, such as single parents, some ethnic minorities, and people with disabilities. So I've shown you that we've got high inequality, unexceptional and average incomes, leaving many households with low incomes, especially poorer ones. Incomes have not grown meaningfully for 15 years now. Finally, let's think about what this protracted period of slow growth has meant for taxation, the public finances, and the quality of public services. We've got the, in the red line, we've got the NHS waiting lists, and we can see that these have doubled since 2014. And importantly, half of this increase happened before the pandemic began. Meanwhile, taxes, the tax to GDP ratios in the gray line there, have been rising and are set to rise further, further and very substantially over the medium term. These developments are another consequence of the UK stagnation. Slow growth means lower GDP in the long run and higher taxes to fund any given amount of public services. However big the demographic pr uh, pressures on public spending are set to become, they're going to be harder to bear if the economy is growing slowly. So let me summarize where we've got to. The UK is in stagnation, with 15 years of low growth leaving us a long way behind the income frontier, and continued high levels of inequality, meaning that nearly all of this burden is borne by those on lower and middle incomes. These low incomes are disproportionately concentrated in certain demographic groups. Now history tells us that we can do better. We narrowed the gap with France, Germany and the USA in the 90s and the early 2000s, so we can do it again. History also tells us that we can do worse, or just doing this badly for much longer. Italy's experience of stagnation started early, back in the 90s, with commensurably uh, worse consequences for incomes over the long term. History gives us a final lesson, which I think is the most sobering of all, which is that when democracies fail, like we're failing, to meet their citizens' expectations, the very democratic fabric of the country can be damaged. If the prospect of providing material conditions that are better for our compatriots were not reason enough to do better, then the need to repair and su to support our democratic fabric should be. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, um, Greg. I'm sure lots of those individual parts obviously aren't new to you. You probably noticed the economy wasn't growing and you're all living in a society with high inequality. But I think we would, one of the things we would take away from doing this project so far is that the interaction of those two and the length of time that they have gone on for means that we need to, you know, you just step back and think, where has that left us? And I think our conclusion is worse than we thought. The end. And, and we shouldn't just think about one more year of slow growth or one more year of high inequality. It's the cumulative effect of those and the interaction of them that is so um, dangerous. Now, Manoush, you've been overseeing this project. Over to you. Okay. Thank you, Torsten. Um, I wanted to just make three points. First, um, the low growth so story is dead serious. Um, there is, you know, it used to be sort of conventional wisdom that China, if China grew less than 5% a year, the, the Communist Party's hold on power would collapse. Um, and I think it also equally applies to democratic countries, that if, you're, if you can't deliver higher st living standards on a consistent basis, your politics gets very, very risky. And, you know, it made me think my, my, my 
German mother-in-law, who is a World War II survivor, used to always say, everything is better with butter. <laughs> and I think it's like that with growth. Everything is better with growth. You know, when I was at the IMF and we used to look at kind of debt sustainability and macro projections, you know, 0.1% increase in growth makes everything better. The fiscal position, your ability to spend on public services, your debt sustainability, your ability to invest in things like well-being. Um, and we've been giving away 0.1% of growth, 0.2% of growth here and there through a series of policy choices that we've made over the last 10 to 15 years. And before you know it, you're poor. Uh, and I think we've been taking some of the growth agenda for granted. And of course, for living standards, productivity is the holy grail. And you know, we spent a lot of time on the productivity puzzle in the UK. Many, anyone who's worked on the UK economy has spent the last decade. And when I was at the Bank of England, we had like seven running explanations as to what was driving the productivity puzzle. And I think what the work of the inquiry shows, that it's actually pretty simple. Our investment is too low. Our public investment is too low, and our private investment is too low. Uh, and everything else is add-on explanations. But that is the fundamental driver of why productivity is so low. And reducing taxes is not going to deliver more growth, uh, <laughs> but... What? <laughs> you know, We've got a problem. There isn't a lot of support for the Laffer curve in the economic literature, uh, but, but, investment, but, but, but higher investment will deliver more growth. So that would be my first point, that the growth and investment story is dead serious. My second point would be about services economies, which we are. Um, services economies are in the end about people. It, there isn't that much physical capital involved in a service economy. Of course you need digital and you need uh, infrastructure and broadband and all that stuff. Uh, and you need to get people to their workplaces, although not so much anymore. <laughs> but, but, but a service economy is in the end about human capital. And we're, we're moving into a world in which everyone will need tertiary education. That if you've only got a secondary school education, you will not have a good life. And we are not preparing ourselves for that world. And I don't mean everyone needs to go to university. I mean everyone needs to have tertiary education, which includes further education or some sort of training that goes beyond secondary in order to have a decent standard of living. I think the fact that the government is considering a lifelong learning entitlement is a good step in that direction to level the playing field, to enable people to, to continue to learn beyond secondary school. I just hope that it's a serious proposition, that its scale is large, that the interest rate reflects that this is an investment in human capital and not a business proposition, uh, and that with a rate of return on average to education of between, between 10 and 20 percent, I think that's a really good investment for the Treasury to make. Um, I think there are other aspects of enabling human capital to be deployed more, more efficiently. Uh, I'm a big fan of flex security, where you have highly flexible labor markets, but you support people to transition by having very high replacement rates on unemployment insurance and much more serious investment in skills and training. You know, a country like Denmark invests 10 times more than we do on active labor market policies. We're not even in the right ballpark in terms of skills training. But if we're going to be a services economy, we need to fundamentally rethink the way we approach human capital, including things like greater tax credits for firms to train their workers and to get the apprenticeship levy to work, for example. My third point is on kind of what's our new social contract for the UK. And I would say this, wouldn't I, having written a book on this topic. But um, you know, we kind of did the Washington consensus and market fundamentalism and liberalization in the Thatcher period. We then did the third way where the model was basically, let's have high growth and redistribute. Uh, and that collapsed after the financial crisis. And we haven't really got a new model. And for me, I think the right model is one which is, uh, which is one which has a, a bigger social contract, where we invest more in each other and ask more of each other. And by invest more in each other, I mean much more serious attention to things like early years education, lifelong learning and skills, higher public investment in, in infrastructure, but also ask more of each other. And by that, I mean asking people to work longer, asking people to, 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 to pay tax, uh, and closing some of the egregious loopholes in our tax system, uh, 
looking at things like property taxes, which are where two-thirds of global wealth is held in property, and yet that's grossly under tax. I'm sure Adair will talk about a carbon tax, so I'm going to leave that space for him. And things like supporting people to be able to contribute more. We have the highest childcare costs in Europe. Many women are not able to work because childcare make costs make it prohibitive. If we have, we have more women going to university than men in the UK, if we could get those women in the labor market by supporting childcare more sensibly, we could again increase productivity. And so for me, I think we need to think about changing the structure of both security and opportunity in our economy to ask more of people and to invest more in them to move to a higher productivity, higher growth, and happier economy. We're all happier. Thank you very much, Manoush. We want to be happy people. Are you going to make us happy or are you going to bring us down? <laughs> well, three comments, a few comments on the analysis on what, if anything, we know about what it's going to look like going forward and, uh, and what matters, and then a few points on obvious policy as, and obvious not policies. So I found this an incredibly fascinating report to read. It really does make you feel how badly the UK has done over the last 14 or 15 years. And the thing I would add to that is how badly the UK has done despite what ought to be an enormous structural advantage of the English language, right? In a world where there is a service economy, there is a creative economy, an artistic economy, we're sitting with a huge advantage versus other people and yet we're falling behind. The second thing that struck me is this crucial insight of the interface between the combination of average earnings relativity and inequality. When people in the top 10% of the UK income distribution go on business or on holiday to France or Germany, they don't feel poor relative to their counterparts in those other countries, because they're not poor. They can afford roughly the same restaurants, hotels, their houses look the same, etc. But as this shows clearly, when you go to the middle income and lower income levels, it's much lower, very significantly behind. Though that does pose a political problem in a sense of the reaction to that, because those lower income groups typically go once a year to the continent, often on holidays which are essentially in an enclave environment, and they may not realise how much poorer they are than the average person at the same income distribution. And that may have a political implication for just, do, are people not as worked up about this uh, as they should be? The third, I was very interested by the thing on page 36, which shows the very different performance on productivity versus jobs and hours worked. Mm -hmm. Now, it depends whether you think multiplying hours work is a good thing. I mean, broadly speaking, it, it, and it's the flip side of productivity. And that brings me to my first of three points about understanding what is going on here and how things look going forward. I would start with the proposition that we have to realise that flexible labour markets, for which we have been so proud in the UK, which were created by uh, Thatcher and which were continued, broadly speaking, by Blair and Brown, they are double-edged swords. It says clearly in this that the reason why France has a higher rate of productivity than the UK is it has higher investment. Now, anybody who knows French business leaders knows one of the reasons why they have a higher level of investment, which is that they've got an inflexible labour market. They can't easily get rid of labour once they've employed it, so they automate, automate, automate to not have to employ it in the first place. <laughs> Flexible labour markets tend to create productivity. There is a trade-off, and we've got to debate that product trade-off, and I think we went too far down the direction of hyper-flexible labour markets. Secondly, where are we on Brexit? There's an interesting analysis in here which starts with a sort of counterintuitive that... Uh, our relative exports to Europe, relative to everywhere else in the world, don't seem to have gone down. And you might think they, or they've not gone down as much as you might think. But what it actually says is that the openness of our whole economy has degraded, and it suggests a set of model forecasts that suggest that that will go on dramatically in the next six years, and that by 
2030, we could have 24% less exports than we would have had if we hadn't had Brexit. And if that is true, and I think we've really got to, you know, you've got to be careful of model results, but it does reflect the intuition that when you leave a customs union, and it is, I think, the customs union which is vital here, not the single market. When you leave a customs union which allows you to create deep supply chain linkages with the area in the world right next to you, and in a world where intra-regional trade across the world is far more intensive than trade from one end of the world uh, to another, when you do that, you can undermine your competitiveness or your openness not only in relation to that regional trading block, but also in relation to the world, which basically says the whole idea that by getting out of Europe we became a more global Britain is fundamentally flawed. Now, what are we going to do about that? Logically, Britain, <coughs> having voted for uh, Brexit, should have stayed in the customs union. It was damn close. The indicative vote in March 2019, almost in Parliament, produced a majority for staying in the customs union. Logically, we should go back into the customs union, and there is not the slightest chance that we're going to. Um, and we have to just live with, you know, how do we think about that? If that 24% is right, and we're not going to take the most fundamental policy that might help reverse it, we're going to have to think carefully about what else flows from it. Finally, on the analysis, I think the analysis on climate change here is absolutely right. It's very important not to overstate the impact on climate change, particularly on employment structures. When we get to a zero carbon economy, broadly speaking, many, many people will be doing exactly what they would have been doing in any case. Care workers and lawyers, waiters and bankers, nurses and doctors, police women and, and police men, people working in the creative arts. Broadly speaking, they'll do exactly what they are at the moment, but the electricity that they use in order to do that will come from green sources. And the cost of that electricity, as much as makes no difference, will be, broadly speaking, the same as it is today. Right? This is not a massive change in occupational structure. The Climate Change Committee's reports, which the report a, 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 a refers to, suggest that at the core of the occupational effect, there are two significant ones and everything else is trivial. We'll probably have about 200,000 less jobs in the maintenance and repair of vehicles, essentially because electric vehicles are much simpler and don't tend to break down. So there's a whole load of jobs going to go there, roughly spread across the, across the country, and we need about 200,000 more jobs in the plumbers and the electricians and the small construction trades to insulate our houses better and to put in heat pumps. Apart from that, the employment effects are actually quite trivial. And that 200,000 plus, 200,000 <coughs> negative, is very small compared with, and by the way, not regionally concentrated, either in the destruction or the new jobs, is very small and less a, uh, regionally concentrated than the big regionally concentrated deindustrialization of the early 1980s, let alone the previous hundred years of the massive movement of people from the countryside, from farm uh, to factory. So I think it's absolutely right in that. We have to get the climate change transition right, but we must make sure that we don't overstate how transformational it is uh, on our economy. Finally, what do we do in answer? Well, I'm still thinking about that, but I think some things are obvious, and some things are obvious because they're good for society, even if we're not absolutely convinced that they will drive a productivity growth, um, though they will probably drive productivity growth as well. We need to make sure we nourish an internationally traded sector, and that has to be a lot to do with science and creative arts, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe a small number of people will work in that, but high-value-added, high-paid, internationally traded jobs are important. We need also to make sure that we drive productivity in non-traded sectors of the economy. For instance, in all of that stuff that we have to do to insulate our houses better. And I think a lot of that has about training and skills. You know, we just don't have enough of these plumbers and electricians to do, to either create those jobs, which would be a good thing, or to deal with the climate transition. We should address some issues both of inequality and of dignity. Look, we should pay people in care homes more. Quite straightforward. We are, at the moment, 
paying people doing a vitally important and wonderful job, we've used contracting out to drive their conditions and pay to the absolute limit. And we should stop doing that. But to do that, we're probably going to have to pay more tax. And the one thing I think is missing this report is taking head on the tax issue. We are now in the middle, as we know, of the most absurd three-day uh, tax cut auction uh, that you could uh, imagine. What I would like to see is an analysis of where is our tax rate and our public spend as a percent of GDP versus those countries where we are behind. I know the answer with France. France has a much higher tax rate. I would say actually too high, uh, but we could be quite a lot up and we'd still be way below where they are. Germany has somewhat higher rate. The Scandinavians all have higher. If we're basically saying all these other countries are doing better, I think we actually have to take head on the debate that not only should we be rejecting this absurd auction about tax cuts at the moment, but maybe a somewhat higher, not much higher, but somewhat higher rate of tax is essential for an optimal response to the challenges that we face. Great. Thank you very much, Adair. The bad, news, uh, the bad news is you have not got the 30 votes required to proceed to the next round. Uh, but you know, there's trade-offs in life. The, you also get lots of points for giving people specific pages to read. Yep. Page 36, don't read them during this. There's people speaking. You've totally failed on any discipline of the division of these sessions over the course of today. So no more climate change chat okay. until the next session. Otherwise, the people on that panel will kill us. Now, Mari, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I was... I was struck when I was reading um, particularly this, this chapter, um, the sort of frustrations for me that shone through about the, the misunderstanding of the nature of the UK economy and how that um, pervades into economic policy thinking such as it is, uh, and strategy um, as such as it is in the UK. Um, much of our work at the Institute focuses on deepening the understanding of the actual nature of the UK economy and um, the different regions and nations within the UK, um, working with UK government devolved governments and local government to, you know, just telling them the actual nature of the economies that they are responsible for can be um, it's almost too powerful um, because they just don't understand the nature of the economy and how much of it relies on uh, more foundational sectors, for example. Um, and that really matters for the capacity of our economy to deal with the, the skills that we require for the future. Um, and also um, injects a bit of realism into the fact that not every area of the country can be a hub for the, the more kind of sexy sectors of the economy on fintech or life sciences or, or whatever it is. Um, and there is this sort of economic um, policy obsession um, that's talked about in the, the analysis around you know, the UK being like other countries that it is not like um, and it will never be like. Um, and it's more important to focus on the strengths that we have. You know, so that may be Germany, um, or actually more often Scotland, it tends to be Nordic countries. Um, you, know, you want all of these benefits without some of the costs, and particularly when we're talking about Scandinavian countries, that, that tends to be higher taxes. Um, but I wouldn't, um, <laughs> you would expect me as an economic statistician to talk a bit about the data and evidence that you've gathered and some of the limitations that there still is in understanding, particularly regional differences within the UK. Understanding is improved by the analysis that you have done, but it can go further. Um, and one of the things you talk about is obviously business investment and the UK's poor performance in business investment. There are no data on how that is spread across the UK. Um, the Scottish Government produced an estimate for Scotland, and what it shows is that there is significantly lower levels of business investment in Scotland, even compared to the poor level of UK. So, um, you know, there, there is also, there also has to be, I think, investment in data so that we understand better how things um, vary across the UK and why that might be. Um, this has been highlighted by the uh, recent levelling up agenda and the attempts to um, identify different areas of the, the UK to invest in by the UK government. Um, you know, we, we don't have consistent um, indices of things like deprivation across the UK to be able to actually do that on a systematic and evidence-based basis. And I think that's a huge problem. Um, and I know it's one that, that ONS are dealing with um, and trying to make um, progress on. But I, I think the, the data deficiencies we have in the UK for a really deep understanding of both um, the levels of regional inequality and also the causes for it is something that needs to be addressed. 
I would say that as a statistician, but I, am, I, I think it's a really important um, area to pursue. I was struck as well that many of the areas that are highlighted in the report in terms of, um, you know, both uh, as identifying the problem and, and potentially um, the solution, such as the development of human capital, um, issues around housing, which seem to be key to the gaps in wealth that have, have accumulated, and the sort of um, outlook um, for the prospects for young people in particular, are, are kind of out of the realm of traditional economic policy. Um, and when we talk about education, um, or the, the treatment of health outcomes, which are very different for different parts of the UK or different households, um, you know, these, these do tend to be out with the, the, the areas of, of traditional economic strategy. And that brings me to another thing um, which I think is important to consider about the policy solutions, in that many of these responsibilities sit with different layers of government in the UK. Um, now, devolution in the UK is, <laughs> is an interesting natural experiment, um, and, you know, devolution has been done differently even in the devolved nations, and now we have um, you know, a, a, a patchwork of different devolution settlements for different parts of England. Um, so part of the solution here is going to have to be different levels of government working together um, to, towards common goals. And I realise that there are um, political realities in that which make it difficult, um, particularly um, in Scotland right now. Um, and there are quite different approaches in different parts of the UK for some social policy issues that Adair touched on, such as social care which do provide interesting natural experiments, uh, but also might make it difficult to deal with these issues um, on a kind of strategic basis across the UK. And this relates to some of the policy solutions that the UK government have been proposing on, on around levelling up. Um, it's mentioned in the report as well, the sort of piecemeal approach to challenge funds for local authorities to bid into is in no way a strategic approach to levelling up or dealing with the, the, the structural inequalities we have in the UK, and it has no um, bearing at all on the evidence of what actually works to reduce uh, inequalities, and that comes back to evidence-based policy approaches. You know, um, some of the things that have been done to help young people, um, in theory, to um, get on the housing ladder and to buy their first home, are simply um, approaches which lead to prices going up further and, and compounding the problem, even though all of the evidence would tell us that's what would happen, and people say that's what would happen, um, and I'm sure civil servants say that's what will happen. These, these are still the policy approaches that are pursued because they're, they're seen to be popular. Um, another um, area which may be explored more perhaps in the final report, I think, is, is inactivity in the UK and the way it varies across the UK and why. Um, in a very tight labour market, that's really the question we should be asking. Not, not more hours, I don't think, for anyone, but how can we get people who are dislocated from the labour market who wish to join it to, um, to engage in it? So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Mary. <laughs> um, right. Now, um, we've got about 20 minutes to um, discuss those rather big questions. I thought we would break this down. <clears throat> so raise your hand in the room or go on Slido and it's hashtag stagnation nation just to remind you of some great questions coming in. I thought let's try and take this in some kind of order. So we've got, we've got low growth, we've got high inequality, and we've got the combination of the two, broadly. Okay, so let's try and take those. So why don't we start with the um, headline question on low growth. And Manusha, I don't know if you want to take this one, but which is, we're a given across this discussion is that low growth is a bad thing, almost. Okay, that hasn't been the always the fashionable view everywhere in British policy debates over um, recent years, either because um, you know, the degrowth argument, sometimes driven by environmental or green concerns or equity concerns, um, or I remember doing an interview with John Redwood the other day who said, uh, and I was saying it might be a good idea to trade, um, and he said, um, well, look, we've overdone that. It's more important to be produce stuff here than to be rich, basically, was the gist of the uh, question. Now, so it's, it's on the left and the right. You have versions of it. Or the other version on the left is sometimes... Even if you get growth, it doesn't make a difference to ordinary households, so we shouldn't focus on it as much broadly. What do you reckon? Yeah. <clears throat> I think thinking that growth is not necessary is deeply misguided. And I'm, I've got some colleagues from the LSE here. I think Richard Laird would argue that growth helps investments in well-being, that you, it's not a trade-off between growth and well-being. Growth is not everything, and you need to look at a broad set of indicators to design economic policies, including measures of well-being. 
but, but growth is part of the story. And I think Nick, my colleague Nick Stern, would also argue that for the green agenda, you need investment and growth to transform the economy to do the kinds of things that Adair have been talking about. So I think the idea that we can be a, a low growth, green and happy economy is, um, is just not realistic. I think the chart that Greg put up on the NHS waiting list, that's what low growth gives you, low quality public services and an inability to respond to people's demands. So I, I guess I would reject that. Argument. Okay, okay. I thought that might be where you were going to be. Um, I do think if there's one, there's, a, there's two charts actually. Greg showed one of them in the report, but I do think one thing that's really important. I think everyone kind of gets this, but the reason wages haven't grown is because our economy hasn't grown. It's not that wage inequality has gone up and the rich have snaffled it all in the last decade. It's because the economy hasn't grown, and that fundamental thing is, is, and unless you think low wages are a good idea, which I don't think anyone, no, right, there, then you need some of this growth stuff. Right, then Adair for you, the other one, which is high inequality, so high by European standards, obviously not high by American standards. The, um, I think Bulgaria is still ahead of us, so well done, Bulgaria. The, um, but again, if you went back 20 years, people would have said, yes, we are about as high. We haven't got more unequal over those 20 years in big picture terms. Yeah, yeah. The, really, the top 1% has done better, but for most of society, it hasn't changed that much. And our, and our relative position versus other countries isn't way worse than it was 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, people would have said, yeah, yeah, we're high in equality, but that doesn't matter too much. So why have you all become a bunch of hippies? What was the what did, you, what did you say at the what, end? Why have you all become a bunch of hippies when 20 years ago, people were like, yeah, yeah, inequality is high, but, you know, that's not the most important thing? Um... You can ignore the pejorative bit of the question. If you would. I, I think you can't start with the point of view that any level of inequality is bad. I can't imagine any human society which won't have a significant amount of inequality. But I think you have to look at the impact of inequality of income and wealth on equality of opportunity. And you also have to just have some sense that there is a level of inequality which is, which is too much. I mean, we're at a sort of complicated area here about, you know, are meritocracies good or are meritocracies bad for the reasons that Michael Young described, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I certainly believe that the level of inequality which we see is in some sense corrosive uh, to our, um, our social glue. Up until... Uh, 20 years ago, I was most worried about the divergence between the bottom end of the distribution and the middle. And the good news is that the minimum wage did make a significant difference to that. And I was the second chair of the Low Pay Commission. And in 2003, we deliberately put it onto four years where we increased the minimum wage faster than the growth of average earnings by a significant amount as a deliberate decision that we had to start driving it up. And I think that has been a success of public intervention. And you can see that in the figures, that the relationship between the bottom decile and the median begins to stabilize or improve a bit from then. And I think where we are now at that bottom to middle level is we need to focus on the very specific things that make people poor. And I think ultimately it is housing and transport to work and a set of things like that, disability. Uh, 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 and disability and various other things that make people poor. And we need interventions that address those uh, challenges rather than focusing simply on the, the monetary income where we have made a significant uh, intervention. I think at the top end there is... You know, one people people say, well, you know, who cares whether Bill Gates is rich? You know, and, and there's all that evidence that show that when people worry about inequality, they worry about somebody whom they can see and relate to, who's not far away in the income distribution. So there's a, a thesis that that doesn't matter, but I think it does, and I think it does matter particularly because of the massive increase in the inequality of wealth that it is driven by the accumulated effect and the impact that that is having on, um, on, on the potential for physical mobility. I mean, the, the fact that it is pretty much impossible for somebody who is brought up in uh, you know, a middle-income family 
outside central London and who's not going to, at some stage in their life, either get parental help or to inherit a central London property to aspire to own a central London property. And that is completely different from they can aspire you know, to it. 30 years ago. They can ago. aspire to it. They just have to marry someone very targeted. They, they have to marry someone very targeted. Or not marry, either's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be hooked so, up. So, you know, I, I, I do think... I, I do think it is, is concerning, and I think, we should, uh, I think we should worry about it. Very good. Here's another go at an answer. I, I can't remember if this chart made it into the report, but we won't show it to you today. But can public concern about inequality, so we live in a democracy, one of the reasons why politicians started talking about it is because public concern about inequality and poverty has gone up. It doesn't go up when inequality goes up in the 1980s. It goes up when growth stops just before the financial crisis. And so that is what I think the public are basically... Right, which is the combination of the two is what is so... Um, I mean, they're both undesirable in their own ways, but I think our argument in the report is you should focus more on how the two interact. And you want to know why there's food banks when you get energy crisis kicking off this year? Low growth plus high inequality means our poor are much poorer than their equivalents in other countries. Now, Murray, we talked about the a combination of the two, how it affects lower-income households. One of the other things um, that we touch on, and there's a question here from Matt which I'm going to hopefully manage to make the IT work and bring up. Here we go. Hopefully it should come from the screen in front of you. But, oh, my God, the IT does work. Look, there's not a productivity crisis. It's surging. Right, so basically it's bad for lower-income households, high inequality, high, growth, high inequality and low growth. It's also very bad for the young, is basically. So Matt's focusing on the wealth aspect of that here. We in the report also focus on whose labour market prospects are most damaged by low growth. What do you reckon? Yeah, absolutely. Well, building a bit on what Adair talked about as well, I mean, as well as this, this uh, um, low um, wage growth that we've seen or no wage growth that we've seen over the, uh, since the financial crisis, there's obviously also been a real restriction on um, uh, social security help for working age households, which has kind of compounded the problem and we see in work poverty increasing, which in turn leads to child poverty increasing. And then, you know, the young people then... Um, entering the labour market with, with fewer life chances because of that as well. But yes, we do need to talk more about intergenerational wealth transfer. That's the really striking increase in inequality that you highlight in your report. Um, this, these massive amounts of, of housing wealth that are concentrated in older people who were able to buy houses, um, you know, maybe through right to buy, but certainly, you know, many years ago. Uh, and the prospects for young people to do that are, are diminished unless they then get this transferred um, through, through generations. And so we need to, at some point, grasp the nettle of these issues around wealth, the wealth being hoarded in, in, in older people, which means that um, young people today have less chance than, than their parents of, um, of owning their own home um, in, in the future. So this absolutely has to be dealt with. Um, and it has to go hand in hand, I suppose, of thinking about how we, we pay for um, caring for older people um, Are you about country. to break the rules? <laughs> That's the third session, people. <laughs> right. The, um, there may not be discipline in leadership elections, but there's going to be in this room. The, uh, right, let's take a question in the room here. A lot of what you've just been talking about there is to do with the planning system and the way that uh, policy has inadvertently or maybe deliberately put money in the pockets of homeowners in the Great Southeast by not um, increasing the supply of houses. I've benefited from that. That's partly because I targeted my marriage decisions, which allowed me to do that. I told you. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Love matches overrated. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, well, they, so we've identified, uh, I think the policy problem is, is identifiable. But the issue is about how the politics interact with that. So clearly, you know, in fairness, the Conservatives, it seems like it's part of the Conservatives that have tried to change it, and unsurprisingly, you know, another part of the Conservative wing has pushed back on that. But then you see the activity, say, of the Lib Dems as well, which have then sort of jumped on the anti-growth element around, um, around places where housing is a particular problem, where policy is really cutting in, and then we sort of get in this position where we seem to fall back to not do anything about the planning system. So politically, how do we get around that? So you have been very bad. Not in your marriage, because houses last even if love doesn't. But uh, because David is going to be addressing this in his politics session uh, shortly. But, the, um, but it is a fair one. So, I mean, Manoush, why is politics not reforming planning? planning? Because old people vote more than young people. Oh, right. Um, that's the, I mean, that's the honest answer, right? Um, but so I think part of this is about voting reform. Uh, why don't we have 
online voting and digital voting to encourage young people to exercise their political power more. Well, you, look, you've got a clap. Uh, <laughs> Only <laughs> one, you, but there was a clap. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Your co-chair clap, you get zero uh, points for that. I mean, David, David has, has written more about this and, and, and has thought a lot about it, but I think voting reform is part of the solution. I think also, you know, I think you have to offer older generations a deal which involves higher property taxation mm -hmm. to deal with some of those inequalities in exchange for a better system of social care and a sense of a package. You know, sometimes making the problem bigger makes it easier to solve because you can trade things off. And so I guess that's what I'd say as well. Very good. Right, one for you, Greg, here, which is just on this big picture, uh, which will just come up on the screens, hopefully, the, um, from Owen, the, um, which is basically saying, look, yes, growth is slow. It's slow everywhere. Uh, get over it. And one argument that's been made about why it's slow is that um, Robert Gordon's book about where rubbish and technology basically and nothing's as useful as the toilet is the slight. It's a long book. It's a long book. It's a long book, that's it's a long book but it basically <laughs> collapses into that as like a core uh, argument. So, Greg, should we just get over it? Uh, well, well, toilets are very useful. I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, but uh, but what, what Robert Gordon says is it was like electrification, indoor plumbing, the passenger jet, the telephone, and these were all kind of invented between 1870 and 1970 and then we're done, right? And, and, then, and then there's nothing that's going to come along that's going to be as big as that. Now, I can't peer into the future. I, I see lots of very promising, sometimes quite disturbing uh, predictions about what uh, artificial intelligence is going to do and how it's going to touch parts of the economy that, that maybe haven't been touched by automation before. But, but uh, wherever the frontier is going to go, uh, the gap between us and the frontier has opened up and it's unacceptably large. Uh, and it doesn't need to be this big. Uh, the, the United Kingdom was once the frontier and, and, and while we might not aspire to be like that again, um, we were certainly you know, uh, comparable to, to France and Germany, if not within my lifetime, then within my, within my parents' lifetime, and, and I think we can be again. So, so Robert Gordon's writing about the United States, principally, the United States is the frontier. We are not, and I think we can get closer. Very good, do some catch up, guys. Right, let's bring up a first poll. You can't vote in the room unless you go on Slido. Strong incentives, we believe in incentives and markets here. There, here's the poll question. So, which of these, oh no, no it's not. Wait a second, there you go. Right, you only allowed one. Which one matters most? Below growth, the inequality between people, the inequality between places, no one's doing any investment, or is the problem that taxes are going up and that is squashing human inspiration and freedom? The, um, which one do you want? Right, we'll go quickly across the panel. You're only allowed one. I don't want a reason why it's complicated and you want three. Murray, which one are you going for? Right, big economic gaps between places. Places, economic geography, Adair? I'm actually going for the same one. Yeah. Oh, right. That's a bit boring. Yeah. Right, Manoush? I would go for low productivity because that would help you solve all the others. That would indeed. Greg? And I'm going to go for high inequality between people. All right, you see, we've got some different views there. You're all coming in. Um, I'll give you the results in a second. Right, let's take a question in the room from a gentleman over here. Yeah, um, Chris Wakeley. I <coughs> run, Greg, that AI and data science business that you're probably talking about. Um, I, I was just interested to bring the conversation back to where do you think growth is going to come from and I was quite struck as I walked in the room, unfortunately a little bit late, about that there wouldn't be that much disruption because there would be carers and waiters and various other things, which of course I agree. But I think we're heading into quite a different paradigm, um, both around consumption and what we should and shouldn't consume and other about the provision of services and dare I say the role of machines going forward. So I'd be interested in your view as to where growth is coming from in the future. Very good. The, Adele, why don't you take that and then you can maybe link that back to the whole Robert Gordon, are we going to get any growth question? Well, it does link to that. And I, I, I guess, this, I just don't know the answers any longer, uh, which for those who know you, know me is a very that is, odd. That is, that is both honest, very, odd very bad marketing, because they're not here for you to tell them we don't know the answer. I think there is something in the Robert Gordon argument, or there may be. Right? There is nothing inherent about the nature of productivity growth that the same amount of productivity growth in each generation has the same capacity to increase human welfare. I think it is quite possible that there were these fundamental breakthroughs of washing machines and dishwashers and hoovers, which, you know, freed women from you know, endless domestic uh, work. There were the ability to 
for the first time in your life, you know, fly on a holiday. And I think you can't necessarily assume that those increases in, in, in welfare, that what happens is in future equally beneficial. I think it is also probably the case that we are seeing both hidden productivity improvements, but hidden productivity improvements which aren't necessarily all that important for human welfare. Um, Marty Feldstein, who died a couple of years ago, used to argue that the national income accountants had an absolutely unsolvable problem about measuring productivity, that when you had a computer game, uh, which now has 10,000 times as much computing power as it did 20 years ago, but costs less, has productivity not gone up at all because the value added we measure in monetary terms is lower, or has it gone up 10,000 times because you've got a physical uh, productivity? On the other hand, the question is, are adolescents happier playing computer games uh, rather than what they did 30 years ago? So I think there are some, you know, I don't think we should simply leap to Oh, all that stuff about the fundamental nature of the relationship between productivity growth, uh, phases of productivity growth, human welfare, uh, that was a diversion. Let's just get back to growth, growth, growth. I think that is walking away from some really quite conceptually difficult and potentially very important issues uh, about the future uh, development of the economy. I think what you, the resolution of this is that there are undoubtedly you know, some forms of growth which are beneficial. And I think you do have to, with the risk growth, not get too fixated on the macro figures, but say, if at the end of the day, you know, I am not delivering um, you know, health care of a higher quality you know, at a, a, a stable cost, that is a disadvantage. Right? If I am not able to have plumbers or can turn up and put in heat pumps at a lower price than they were able to last year, that is a problem. So I am you know, philosophically much more worried about these issues, about one, how we measure growth and what is the relationship between either measured or unmeasured growth and human welfare. Uh, than I think has been the tone of the debate so far. But I still end up believing that there's a whole set of policy measures um, which we should take, which will make society better and will probably also produce a higher level of measured growth. So that is how I resolve those issues. Very good. The, um, uh, so I don't think we've totally told you where growth is going to come from, but if you could grow your business, that would help. So keep it up. Right. Now, I want to, st to start wrapping this up, let's bring up the results of the poll, but then just to give you a warning, everyone, I want to then come to what are the consequences of a country that gets stuck in stagnation for a long period. So who have you gone with? It's basically a popularity contest, and Manoush has won. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. So, the, um, but, you know, broadly, the, the whole book, if you only take one sentence away from it, is low growth and high inequality are a toxic combination. The, um, that's what people are broadly uh, worried about. As I say, the 2% are more representative of... Uh, other things being debated um, at the moment, but the two, you know, two percent is important. People, it's a democracy, right? So, look, one of the arguments in the book is um, uh, that societies pulling together, as you argued in your book, on have underpinned by social contracts. The, court, the what does that pulling together changes over time, but that in modern democracies that are more diverse. Um, uh, than they once were. Yes, it's still bonds of shared culture and history, but it's also, over the last m least half a century or more, is driven by the promise of shared prosperity. Is what holds societies together in modern democracies <laughs> is we will do better together, right? and both are, both are important. That the future is better than today, and we're all in this together, are both important parts of what holds societies um, together. And that countries... And you know, countries, for lots of reasons, have challenges to their economic model. We did it to New Zealand in the 70s when we basically shut off their largest market. And your exam question isn't, are things difficult? It's, what do you do when that happens? And that there's nothing automatic about solving that. But if it doesn't, it causes you other long-lasting problems. Greg showed you one, which we can show in a chart, which is what happens to your tax burden, your public service quality. But there are others in terms of the strength of your society and what pressure it puts on your uh, democracy. So can we just touch on that a bit about what people's 
views, now this is not like a prediction of like imminent revolution, right? This is just like a general, in the long run, it's not a good place to be. But what do you think, Manoush? Democracy, basically. This isn't just about economics. <laughs> I think we've already seen some of the consequences, not just in the UK, but in other countries, which is you get this extreme polarization of politics. And um, people going to extreme ideas out of frustration. And you know, historically, you also see a similar pattern. And that's very dangerous. And you can definitely, I mean, if people want like concrete examples, if you look at what's happening to voting patterns by age, if you look at what's happening to demographic divergence, young and old people increasingly living in different places, the, um, which overlaps with some of these productivity graphs that Greg was showing you earlier. You can see how some of that would um, play out. Adair, how, like, given it's bad, what's the level of, you know, at one level the growth models told us people would just catch up, right? So it's kind of automatic that you, it, you kind of deal with your problems because that's what the model says versus, you know, what does Italy or America tell us about how countries deal with these kind of challenges? Well, I think there's no certainty that you get out of an economic stagnation <coughs> trap and Italy is the big concerning one here. I, I wouldn't, you know, we should probably cast our eye over Italy. I think there are a set of sui generis uh, Italian, you know, structural factors to do with the mm -hmm. relation to you know, the long unresolved relationship between the North and the South, uh, 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 etc. But it certainly tells us that you know, the fact that you have 10 to 15 years of this stagnation doesn't mean that you're not going to get another 10 to 15 years. On the democracy point, I absolutely agree that one of the potential consequences of this stagnation or of income shocks can be a polarization of, uh, you know, a radicalization of, of, of politics. On the other hand, I've got worried that we are turning that into the overall dominant exclusive theory of what is a threat to our democracy. And the thing which makes me realize that we shouldn't do that is if you look at the average income level of the January 6 rioters, they were not low income. Some of them flew in by private plane. Um, there is in the US, and at the, at the biggest threat to uh, democracy in the world I think is country club Republicans in the US. It is a corrosion of you know, moral standards among people who are you know, perfectly well off. Um, I don't think that the undermining of uh, a standards of democracy in either Hungary or Poland by Orban or by the Law and Justice Party have a fundamental economic a, uh, explanation. I think we have to realize that there are autonomous political developments relating to identity and culture wars which have their own dynamics. So yes, there is um, an important role and a stagnation and sudden hits can have a big impact. I mean, the gilet jaune was clearly a, a sudden hit to living standards through a very badly designed sudden increase in a, in a form of carbon tax. But I think we've got to be wary of turning that into a sort of exclusive theory as to what are our threats to uh, democracy. Uh, I think they're very serious in the US, and I think the core of them are maybe not economic. I think they are cultural and identity-based. Okay, stay away from country clubs, people. They're dangerous <laughs> for you and for society. Right, okay, we're going to stick to time today, not least because you only had to get through one graduation ceremony to get in the building today, but manusha has got to do 16 over the course, which is what productivity looks like in a <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I want to say thank you very much to our uh, panel.